this is the second segment of modern materials and here we are going to discuss superconducting ceramics thin films conductors semiconductors and insulators now ceramics are inorganic solid materials and they are resistant to heat corrosion and wear normally they are hard and brittle they're less dense than metals they could be crystalline or non-crystalline so examples include like pottery china cement roof tiles bricks glass the composition of ceramic is silicates so silicon oxide and other metal oxides. It could be carbides, it could be nitrides, it could be just oxides and aluminates, aluminum oxide and other metal oxide mixed together. Now the uses of ceramics in tool industry for cutting, grinding, in a space shuttle, uh, they are used to protect against overheating. Now here we are going to discuss about superconducting ceramics. Normally when electricity flows through a cable, there is a resistance and part of the electrical energy is lost in the form of heat because of the resistance. Now think about superconducting materials. When they, you cool down superconducting materials below a certain temperature, then there will be no resistance to the flow of electricity. Now, these transition temperatures are different depending upon the composition of superconducting materials. For example, for this complex composition, the transition temperature is about 133K. For composition with yttrium is 95k. That means at those temperatures or below those temperatures there will be no resistance for the flow of electrons or electricity through superconducting materials. Minor effect. When we talk about superconductors, minor effect is an important property that we need to know. Now superconductors exclude all the magnetic field. So in other words, if you bring a magnet in front of a superconducting material, the magnet is going to float. Now what are the possible applications? Scientists are thinking that if we have that kind of superconducting substances, then at some point, scientists would be able to de develop magnetically levitated train. And that would need very small amount of energy compared to present day train. Besides, in the designing of electrical generators, electrical motors, fast computers, superconducting materials should be very useful. Now we talk about thin films. So by thin films, we mean thickness of about 0.1 micrometer to about 300 micrometer. So much thinner than normal paint. What characteristics these thin films must have? They must be chemically stable they must firmly adhere to the surface. They should have uniform thickness, should have high purity and almost no imperfection. Now, what are the uses? Decorative purposes, protective purposes, conductors, resistors, microelectronic circuits, optical coating on lenses, 
that re reduces reflection and protects softer glass against scratching. Now st steel drill bit bits are often coated with titanium nitride or tungsten carbide to provide hardness and resistance against wear. Now here we're discussing conductors, semiconductors, and insulators based on valence band and conduction band. First we'll talk about the origin of these formation of valence band and conduction band. If you think about iron atoms, iron has this electronic configuration, so 4s2, 3d6, the outermost ones. Each iron atom would have all these orbitals. When they come close to each other, they overlap. Each time there is an overlap of orbitals, there would be two types of combination. One would be called bonding, bonding molecular orbital. The other one is called anti-bonding, anti-bonding molecular orbital. Let me give you a simple uh, analogy. If I have two waves like this, when they overlap each other, there could be two possible combinations. They constructively interfere. In that case, each this wave, the resultant wave would be much bigger wave because their phases completely match with, with each other. So this is called constructive interference. Or they can destroy each other. Let me show you the destructive one. Drawing line here. Say one is going like this. The other one is going just in opposite manner. So that, the resulting effect is going to be pretty much very tiny uh, oscillation. So in other words, there could be two possible combinations of these waves. One is constructive, the other one is destructive interference. Similarly, in case of an electron, electron behaves like waves. So there could be constructive interference or could be destructive interference. So we can think about two types of combination. One that provides enhanced bonding, which is called bonding molecular orbital. The, the other one decreases bonding effect or reverse effect of bonding. It's called anti-bonding molecular orbital. So there'd be always, whenever there is a combination of two orbitals, one, say one S from one iron, one S from the second iron, then there'd be two molecular orbital formation. One is bonding, which is lower in energy, and the other one is anti-bonding, which is higher in energy. So think about combination of all these orbitals for many, many of these atoms. There'd be huge number of these bonding orbitals, lower in energy, and anti-bonding orbitals higher in energy. And all these bonding orbitals make what we call valence band. Anti-bonding ones make conduction band. In metals or metallic conductors, valence bands are partly filled and the next empty conduction band is very close in energy. Almost there is no gap. So this is like a conductor. The valence band is almost, there is no, no gap. On the other hand, if you look at insulator, there's a large gap. Here, this is the gap we're talking about between a valence band and conduction band. And valence band is completely filled and the next empty conduction band has a large energy gap. And that's why insulators are not conductors because it's hard for electron to jump from lower lying valence band to conduct conduction band before it starts moving. 
in semiconductor the the valence ba bands are almost completely filled and the next conduction band is neither very close nor very far apart so there is a small energy gap relatively smaller energy gap in case of semiconductors now types of semiconductors include n type with doping doping means foreign objects are often added to improve semiconducting properties for example if 5a metal replaces a 4a 5a element replaces the 4a element for, for example phosphorus is added there'll be an extra electron added because there is an one extra electron involved in 5a element and that goes to empty conduction band because valence band is already filled and that enhances conductive conductive conducting property p-type semi semiconductors are formed by doping say for example you are replacing 4a element by a 3a element that means there will be fewer electrons now in the valence band so there will be some room created within the valence band it will be less crowded and that would improve conductivity now we're going to explain to you by simple analogy which which we're going to uh, discuss in next slide that fill, filled valence bond uh, valence band is like highly crowded road and conduction band is like an empty road through which car can move rather fast an electron is like a moving car which needs to get to less crowded conduction band for an easy passage in a conductor conduction band is very close to the valence band and remember we mentioned that valence band is completely filled so electron can't move unless and until it goes to conduction band since conduction band is very close to valence band so electrons at the moving car would be taking that easy path and it go through conduction band rather very fast and that gives high electrical conductivity so keep that in mind in a conductor there is a very small space between conduction band and valence band so when valence band is filled with electrons electrons can readily go to conduct conduction band and pass through quickly giving high conductivity in case of an insulator there's a large gap between valence band and conduction band so electron stays on the within the crowded valence band showing almost no movement and hence no conductivity the situation like that you are driving in a road and which is so crowded that your car doesn't move and the other alternative routes are not that close so you don't have any choice rather than stay in the crowded road and move slowly and that's the case with insulator in within insulators elect, electron can flow very slowly or almost no movement of electrons and that's why insulators do not show much conductivity in a semiconductor there is a small energy gap between valence band and conduction band so it's like having an empty road or less crowded road which is neither too far nor too close to the congested road for the cars to move to so in comparison with a conductor it is harder for electron to go to conduction band but in comparison with insulator it is much easier so that's why semiconductors have properties in between conductor and insulator
Here we're going to discuss about metallic bond. We know that metals are shiny. They're good conductors of heat and electricity. They're malleable and ductile. Now question is why they have this kind of properties. All of this could be explained in terms of loosely bonded electrons. When you try to bend, electrons readjust so there is no crack. So all these properties could be explained in terms of loosely bonded electrons. The good conduct, we know that since electrons are loosely bonded, it can readily conduct from one end to the other end of the metal. It is shiny because again, because of this loosely bonded electron, when light shines on it, electron will be jumping from lower level to higher level. And there are so many such um, orbitals and there's so close orbitals. So a little bit of uh, radiation can promote those electrons and when they come down they give off light and that's why they look so shiny. Here I'd like to go over problem number 71 chapter 12 page 508. They're saying that a semiconductor gallium phosphide has a band gap of 2.2 eV. So Band gap means this is the gap between valence band, let me write down the valence band, and a conduction band. So, so this is the gap they're talking about. And that gap is 2.2 electron volt. Now green LEDs are made from this material. The question is what wavelength of light would be emitted from it from this LED. Now this is how light emission happens. So electron needs to jump from valence band to, to the empty conduction band. When it comes back, it gives off radiation. So that's the radiation. Now we can calculate that. 2.2 electron volt, we can write down in terms of joule. So 2.2 EV times 1 EV is equal, equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 joule. And this would give me 3.52 times 10 to the power minus 19 joule. So that's the gap between valence band and conduction band. And that's the gap which electron has to go through. Now, we can set this energy gap. So we call it delta E. So that's delta E. And that's given by hc over lambda. And we need to get the wavelength lambda. So I can write it down in this form. Lambda equals to hc over delta E, which is 3.52. times 10 to the negative 19 joule. Now we know that H value, which is the Planck's constant, is given by 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule times second. And then value of velocity of light is 3.00 times 10 to the power 8 meter per second. So let's plug in those numbers in here in this expression, which gives me 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule times second times 3.00. I need to use a different pen times 10 to the power. 8 meter per second 
over 3.52 times 10 to the negative 19 joule. So joule, joule would cancel out, second per second would cancel out. This gives meter, and that's the right unit. And I get 5.65 times 10 to the negative 7 meter. And I can change it to nanometer because if I have meter on the bottom, because I want to cancel out meter, and nanometer on the top, one nanometer is 10 to the negative 9 meter. Nano means 10 to the negative 9. And that gives you 565 nanometer. So this is the wavelength of light that be emitted from this material. Before I go over problem 89, page 509, let me draw valence band and conduction band and the band gap for different atom sizes. So this is the valence band which is filled with electron and the empty conduction band which is empty and say we have particle sizes like this relatively bigger particle sizes because here interaction is smaller now let's draw the second energy diagram valence band the bottom one and conduction band way up here when particle size is small now keep something in mind that when particles are smaller in size they can approach much closer so the interaction would be much harder so as the interaction gets greater the band gap is increased now let's go over this problem now this is true false question so statements are given then you have to say whether it's right or wrong and then explain it in part a it says that the band gap of semiconductor decreases as the particle size decreases in the one to 10 nanometer range. As we know that as particle size is decreased, band gap is not decreased, rather it's increased. So this is a false statement. Let's read statement B. It says that the light that is emitted from a semiconductor upon external stimulation becomes longer in wavelength as the particle size decreases. So they're saying that particle size decreases, you are going to get a longer wavelength. That's false too. Now why is false? You'd understand it from the second figure. When particle size is smaller, interaction is harder, so gap is larger, so this is a large gap. When you get light when electron transition takes place from conduction band to, to valence band. So you have to promote an electron from valence band to conduct, conduction band. Let's use a different color. And then when that electron goes backward, then it gives off light. So the larger gap means greater frequency of radiation. Larger frequency means shorter wavelength. So in this case, you'd expect shorter lambda or wavelength. For a small gap, you'd expect longer wavelength. So when particle size is smaller, band gap is larger, you'd expect shorter wavelength, not longer wavelength. 